Thank you, Heavenly Father. We welcome you into this place, Holy Spirit. We welcome you to speak to us, to open our eyes, to open our ears, and most of all, open our hearts, Lord. Lord, till the oceans run dry, you will provide for us, Lord. And if our strength fails, you will lift us up and strengthen us and carry us, Lord. So, Father God, I just pray that you come and meet us today, this day, where our needs meet, where we can be a reasonable and pleasing sacrifice to you. We can be in a place that you can use us, Lord, for your kingdom, for your increase in your light and the increase in your truth, Lord. Because, Lord, without your truth and love, there is no hope in this world. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would pierce our hearts this day with this message that is from your heart. And I thank you, Father, that you watch over us, you always protect and surround us, and that you have given us your wonderful word to be able to grow and mature in the knowledge of who you are, our God, our Creator. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So Jesus, the Word of God, DNA and the design of creation. What happens when one part of our body is hurting, or injured, or not working properly? You know, we take this design, this body, for granted. But we pull a muscle, we hurt our back, we hurt our shoulder, we hurt our neck, we take a fall, and we realize, actually, you know, we needed that muscle, or we needed that arm, or we needed that knee, we needed that hip, you know, and so what happens is you find that the body, you, you know, if, if I've got a sore hip, I'm going to favor the other one, so your body becomes imbalanced, because you're favoring the stronger side, and then you've got the weaker side, and while that restores, and then you find you're going to end up with some kind of thing happening on this side, because you're trying to overcompensate. So, so what happens when a part of our body is not working properly? We overcompensate and we, then we're out of sync. And we realize, geez, that thumb, we really need that thumb. So this brings us to wonderful verses of Paul when he's speaking to the church of Corinthians. We as the body of Christ, we are one body with many members. And this is a scripture many of us are familiar with. And... The Holy Spirit and God really laid this message this morning on my heart. I was going to continue with more of the, the DNA and the scientific side, but it's important that we understand what the Holy Spirit is actually meant and what the body of Christ actually represents as a complete body, as a component or a, sum, or a summation of all the individual parts. So Paul says, for just as the body is one, and yet has many parts, and all the parts of the body, through many, form a single body, so it is with the Messiah. For by one Spirit, all of us, Jews and Greeks, slaves and free, were baptized into one body, and were all privileged to drink from one Spirit. For the body does not consist only one part, but of many. If the foot says, since I am not a hand, I am not part of the body, that does not make it any less part of the body, does it? Or if the ear says, since I am not an eye, I am not part of the body, that does not make it any less part of the body, does it? For if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? 
But now God has arranged the parts, every one of them in the body, according to his plan. Now, if all of it were one part, there wouldn't be a body, would there? So there are many parts, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or the head to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are in fact indispensable. And the parts of the body that we think are less honorable are treated with special honor. And we make our less attractive parts more attractive. However, our attractive parts don't need this. But God has put the body together and has given special honor to the parts that lack it so that there might be no disharmony in the body, but that its parts should, be, should have the same concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is praised, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the Messiah's body and individual parts of it. And God has appointed in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, and then those who perform miracles, and those who have gifts of healing, those who help others, administrators, and those who speak various kinds of languages. Not all are apostles, are they? Not all are prophets, are they? Not all are teachers, are they? And not all perform miracles, do they? And not all have the gift of healing, do they? And not all speak in other languages, do they? And not all interpret, do they? It says, keep on desiring the better gifts, and now I will show you a more excellent way. This is taken from the ISV version. Yeah, and many of us have read it in, you know, King James and that. And I just find the, the English is a bit more sensible. And here Paul is relating the spiritual body as the whole body of Christ. And each of us have a role to play. And as I was saying last week, that as God created us, He has created us unique. He has given us each distinct personalities, abilities, gifts and talents. And no one is above or below other. We are all equal and perfectly united in the body. So your gift of service or your gift to the body, not one is more important than the other. And one of the distinctions is like, you know, I stand here, I don't want to stand up on the pool. I'm here with us together. We are growing and learning together. We are all equal in God's sight. He is not a respecter of persons, but He gives us a role to play according to His plan. So, if we look at the blending our paint, now for those of you who've seen paint being blended in those machines where they put in the the formula and they mix in the certain colors until you get the shade that you want now on the left we have just the blank body the blank canvas now in the spiritual God wants to blend us in our colors our light our shade our contrast our hue our saturation all of that together in one so that as a body is full of color and full of light, the body of Christ is alive. The Holy Spirit quickens us and makes us alive, full of vibrancy. To be a Christian is to be an overcomer, full of life and full of vibrancy. And if you look at the three primary colors and as they're blending into one, and I'll discuss this a bit further, but this is what God does, is He starts blending us. So once we come to the cross and we come to salvation, that is the first step 
But as God continues to work out and we continue to work out our salvation, He starts to blend us, He starts to cleanse our hearts, He starts to take those things and lovingly reveal to us those things that He wants to change within us so that we can be more like Him. And this is this blending. God the painter, God the artist is what we are talking about today. And Paul continues about the ministry of reconciliation. So as one body and as one, as many parts of that body, the, God's design is not for disunity or disharmony. For God is the bringer, he's not the author of confusion, he's the bringer of peace and unity. And I've asked this question many times to God. Why are there so many different churches? Why is your body so divided? And we have so many different denominations, but yet your word tells us that we are one body, one father, one spirit, and one flesh. So Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 11 to 21. Is therefore, since we know what it means to fear the Lord, we try to persuade people. We ourselves are perfectly known to God, and I hope we are also really known to your consciences. We are not recommending ourselves to you again, but are giving you a reason to be proud of us, so that you can answer those who are proud of outward things rather than inward things character so if we were crazy it was for God and if we are sane it is for you for the love of Messiah controls us and in the King James it's, it's constricts us is what he says for the love of God drive and drove the early church this is the Apostles they were driven by the love of God to spread the good news they didn't say what was wrong with this world. They say, look who has come to this world. Jesus. A more excellent way. And for we are convinced of this, that if one person died for all people, therefore all people have died. And he died for all people, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died and rose for them. So then... From now on, we do not think of anyone from a human point of view. Even if we did think of Messiah from a human point of view, we don't think of him that way anymore. Therefore, if anyone is in the Messiah, he is a new creation. The old things have disappeared, and look, all things have become new. All of this comes from God who has reconciled us to himself through the Messiah and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. How much do we need this spirit of reconciliation in this land, in this country, in this world today? Where there's so much division, let's be reconciled back with God as our head, as our cornerstone. And therefore, we are Messiah's representatives. We are His ambassadors. Each and every one of us, the world looks at us to see. You say you're a Christian, so show me a better way. Show me by how, how you, who you are. What, liked, what makes you different than what I believe? So we are His ambassadors, and this is what the... The commandment is thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain is all about. It's about our stewardship and ambassadorship of the name of Jesus Christ. It's not about a swear word. It's about how we represent our King in this earth. As though, therefore we are Messiah's representatives, as though God were pleading through us, we plead on the Messiah's behalf, be reconciled to God. 
And God made the one who did, did not know sin to be sin for us, so that God's righteousness would be produced in us. <coughs> See, this is more plainer English. And it's, it's a lot easier to understand and understand. So it's all about reconciliation. Being reconciled into a relationship and a fellowship with our Creator, God. You know, I said this last week. We can give all the credit to the intricate designs and the wonderful things that God has made. But if we don't give credit and accept the architect and designer and creator, it is all for nothing. So what is your color? What is each of our color? I mean, if we look here, we have, three, you know, we, we learned this in, in art school. Those of us who did art at school and read art, there are three primary colors. And any shade thereof is as a result of the blending thereof. So three primary colors, try unity. And the shading of the colors and the diffusion of light, it's like the purification process that happens. So when you're being purified, it's not a single step. It's a blending or if there's different temperatures or different elements that, or different chemicals that need to be added to remove the dross and to remove the impure elements from the silver. And this is the same with colors. And if you have done art, you will understand that you're blending and you have a palette. And to, to match that shade um, is often very difficult. You know, if you go and paint something, come back to it and try and blend the exact shade again once that paint has dried, it's a very difficult process because you're going to be a, sh a shade too light or a shade too dark. So that's why people try to do it in one go on the one shade and the one color. And this is like God. And so it's what filter are we using? I mean, it's like a photographer with different lenses to filter out or focus or zoom in a photographer as well has their camera and their lenses and their lenses can filter out different lights and they can filter in more blue light or less and and as the lenses come together and what the most interesting thing is if you had to take three lenses you take two lenses over each other you will create a, a, a black space, but when you take three lenses and you place them over each other, it creates white light. So at the heart of the blending of these primary colors is white light. And so this, the seventh color, which is the intersection at the heart of the primary colors, is white. And this reminds me of the marriage supper of the Lamb. In Revelation 19 verse 6, it says, Then I heard what sounded like the voice of a large crowd, like the sound of raging waters, like the sound of powerful thunderclaps, saying, Hallelujah! The Lord our God, the Almighty, is reigning. Let us rejoice and be glad, and give Him glory, because the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. And she has been given the privilege of wearing fine linen, dazzling and pure. And the fine linen represents the righteous deeds of the saints. This is the white robes of linen. And then the angel told me, write this, how blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he told me also, these are the true words of God. And I bowed down at his feet to worship him, but he told me and says, Don't do that. I am a fellow servant, servant with you. And your brothers who rely on what Jesus is saying, worship God. Because what Jesus is saying is the spirit of prophecy. Prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. So as he blends our colors, he's trying to blend our hearts white as snow. And cleanse the chambers of our hearts. So which lens 
are we looking through? On the left we have Lewis Carroll, Alice in Wonderland, through the looking glass. This is the world's way. You know, and it, it, the title of this book, obviously, Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There. So you see, everyone wants to get a glimpse of what's behind the veil. Everyone wants to get a glimpse of what's next. Instead, if you place a lens on the Word of God, look at this picture. It's beautiful. It makes a heart. The reflection of the lens on the Word of God is love. So what filter do we use to measure ourselves with God? Do we look at the world's way? Do we want to know what comes next? Or do we see what the love of God and the truth of God says? Now many of us in science class would have done this with a prism. Where you shine a white light and the light through the lens of the word of God. So a white light is shone through a glass prism. And then the, the light is dispersed into the spectrum, which are the colors of the rainbow. Because now it's going through air, then through glass, and then it's dispersing at that angle. And uh, obviously red light bends less, so red light is at the top. And um, they say here, yeah, blue blends best, as is, is people just to remember, but it's actually violet that's at the bottom. So if you shine the white light through the prism, the 60 degree triangle glass prism, and then out what will be refracted will be the full spectrum of light and the rainbow, the seven colors. But let's have a look at this, because you see what happens is you've got the speed of light coming in, and then it reaches a different medium, so it slows down. So it then disperses, and that's how one gets the spectrum. And but if we look at it in the inverse, the science looks, as I say, looks at matter. So they look at white light and they look at how the, the light is dispersed. But rather we should look at it in the other way. We are the colors of that rainbow. Going through that prism is the word of God. And that's the refining of us into the source of light. So God is taking the colors and bringing it back into the white light, not the other way around. So he's bringing us all our shades, all our parts, all our colors into his light. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> and if we look at the speed of light, this, this was an experiment that was done by Foucault, and I excuse my pronunciation, and Physio, Foucault and Physio, and they experiment in 1850 with light and bouncing it off a rotating mirror and measuring the time it took. So what they had is they would have a source of light directed onto a mirror, then reflected onto a stationary mirror, the second step, which would reflect back and then in the time they would rotate the mirror and then it would reflect back at, at the observer. And that was the initial experiment on how they were calculating the speed of light. So they took the source of the light, reflected it onto a stationary mirror, and where the observer was standing, he couldn't have seen the source of the light. So they changed the angle of the mirror, and the light was reflected back at the observer. And then they measured the distance and the time that it took for the light or the image to come back to them. And, and this is very interesting because we're bringing this back into the reflection and bending our light into his light. So if we look in John 1 verse 3 to 5, it says, Through him all things were made, and apart from him nothing was made that has been made. And in him was life, and that life brought life, sorry, brought light to humanity. And the light shines on in the darkness, and the darkness has never put it out. And in John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says later, On Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have light of life. So this is one of his I am statements. 
But then if we go and read Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16, Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A city located on a hill can't be hidden. People don't light a lamp and put it under a basket or put it on a lampstand and it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before people in such a way that they will see your good actions and glorify your Father in heaven. So the Word, the light, Jesus and us. We are the reflection of His light to others in all of our shades and colors. Who do I see in my mirror? On the left we have a gentleman and, and a, a, a woman. And looking in the mirror, who do I see? Who I once was? Who I want to be? Or who my, you know, what is my, do you see, you know, your past? Do you see who you are as you are today? Are you looking at what has been? Are you looking at behind? Or are you looking at what is to come? And here are two people looking at their reflection. And they're reflecting back on their lives and see themselves as a younger man and a woman in their prime. You know, he, uh, he's on this, this picture, he's got his military photographs and he's got his, his war and you can see he's a handsome young man. But now he's got his pot belly, beard, you know, his body is now sad. He's no longer, but he's still the same man. And, and this is what I say is, who do I see when I look in the mirror? Do I see what I've become or do I see what I am becoming? So the mirror is a reflection of God's light. And we dealt with the scripture a couple of weeks ago, but I want to bring it back in. And in James 1 verse 22, it says, Keep on being obedient to the word and not merely being hearers who deceive themselves. For if anyone hears the word but is not obedient to it, he is like a man who looks at himself in a mirror and studies himself carefully and then goes off and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks at the perfect law of freedom and remains committed to it, thereby demonstrating that he is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of what the law requires, will be blessed in what he does. This is so true. You know, I mean, we as the natural person, as the in our natural bodies, we, the way we look at ourselves in the mirror and the way the Word of God reflects what God wants us or who He wants us to become, our filters are very different. And in Ephesians 5 verse 13 and 14 it says, But everything that is exposed to the light becomes visible. Exposure, like a photograph on a negative, when you take it and you put those chemicals on it and you develop that photograph and the exposure that comes and then the image that is then fastened onto that photographic paper. And this is what the Word of God does to us. It exposes those places in each of us that God wants to shine His light into. And He says, for the light is making everything visible. And that is why it says, wake up, sleeper, arise from the dead, and the Messiah will shine on you. One of my early mentors used to tell me that half an hour was preaching to wake up the dead. And so many times, you know, we forget that we have, we, are being, we have been made alive through Christ. Let's be excited about 
our opportunities this day and be excited about what God, what we can do for Him. And so often we have a distorted view of God and myself in our relationship. And on the left here we have a woman who's looking through glass and water and then reflecting on that you get a distorted picture of who she is. And, or if you're looking in the side mirror of your car, you're looking at what's on the side and what's behind you. You're not focusing on what's ahead. And as I said last week, we forget the things which are past, but we press on to the things that are. We, we press forward and we press on. We don't look at what's behind. So it's about getting our filters and our view of ourselves and our view of God and lining them up together to find out what the will of God is for our lives and the plan of God is because it's often ourselves that hold ourselves back and so what is my view of who I am what do I do what are my actions and what do I say what are my words? Do I bless with my actions or do I curse with them? Do I use control or any form thereof to get my way? Do I give or do I take? Whose needs do I meet? What is more important to me? Do I have preconditions or a conditioned response to others? Do I treat others and love others like I want to be loved? Do I respect myself and others around me? What keeps me busy? How do I spend my time and is it about me? What plans do I have and do they really matter? Am I more focused on the destination than the journey itself? What is in my heart? These are just some questions that we can ask ourselves when we search our own hearts and to see what filters we view ourselves through. And he has a, an image of a hamster on a wheel. Sometimes I feel like I'm just spinning my wheels and the hamster's asking himself, where am I going? What am I doing? Who am I? Yeah, today is going to be one of those days. And many times we find we're spinning the wheels. It's like that car, we get stuck in mud and we just can't get out. Or we're stuck in a rut and we can't get out. And a lot of this has to do with our filters, with our view of ourselves and others and God's view of us. How do we get out of that rut? So what is my view of God? Who? Is God to me? What is in His heart? Do we really want to know? What does He do for me? And has He done for me? And what am I willing to do for Him? Do I pray and read His word? Do I praise and glorify Him with my life? What makes Him happy and gives Him joy? Does He delight in me or do I bring Him pain? Do I spend intimate time with Him? Am I listening to Him? And do I change what I need to for Him or do I change it for me? Do I worship the creation more than the creator? 
Is my laser focus on Him or on this world? What matters most to Him? These are questions as we search ourselves and we search what matters to God and what is really important. Because we have the Holy Spirit in us that searches the deep things of God. And God searches our thoughts and intentions of our hearts. And so often the obstacle of breakthrough in our lives is our own selves. Is myself. The biggest obstacle I've come across is me. You know, I'm the idiot in the equation. And if I don't value God, my creator, how can I value other people or even myself? And this is about, do I understand who I am and how does God feel about me? Does God answer my prayers? Do I talk to God? Do I talk at God? Or do I talk with God? Do I listen? Do I hear His answer? Do I obey? Do I learn? And do I grow? And do I share His answers with others? Do I take God for granted in my daily life? Do I take His mercy for granted? I don't know the hour or the day of His coming. So why do I take Him for granted? Do I want to be caught unaware and not prepared for my Creator? Do I want to be unprepared for meeting Him? If Jesus came now, what would I say to Him? If I received a summons, to which court will I be summoned to appear? Is it mercy or severity? Which eternity have we chosen? Which throne are we going to stand before? The beamer seat, the mercy seat of Jesus? Or are we going to stand before the great white throne? We actually won't stand, we'll be flat on our faces. But so often we get consumed about our own lives that we forget the price that Jesus paid for all our past, our present and future sins, for our families, our generations. And the Holy Spirit just laid this on my heart so strong this week. Remember me. Remember me, your God. So will God actually care about the things that I'm doing? Is my accountability to Him alone? I've made you and formed you and intricately woven you together. How perfectly He designed me. And what am I doing with my gifts and my talents? Matthew chapter 25 verses 14 to 30 is the parable of the talents. Where Jesus gives ten talents, five talents and two talents to His servants. And then in that scripture... The two of them, you know, give increase to the talents and the one who has the least goes and buries it because he's afraid. He's afraid of his master. He's afraid that he'll lose what he's got. And then Jesus takes it away from him. It's, it's a very strong message. So use the gifts and the talents that God gives you, each and every one of us for his glory. For, for His sowing, for His planting. And what does it matter if we live for ourselves and not for Him? Who cares what others are doing or what they are saying about me and the world that we live in? Will any of my plans or actions really matter to God today? And what am I going to do for Him? And why do I always look for what's next? We always want to know the end of the book. 
We are patient. And a couple of weeks ago, I talked about this race that we run for Jesus is being patient. It's a patient race. It's an endurance race. This is a long distance marathon. This life with Jesus. It's a long distance. It's, forget about the two oceans. We're running to eternity here. And it's the eternal life or eternal condemnation. And we are pressing on towards the high calling and the prize that Jesus has offered us to be his bride. Instead we look for what's next. Instead of looking at what's now. In the now time. What's happening now? And what will you do right now? Will God have mercy? And this is a scripture that many of us pass over. We pray for peace. And Jesus says in the book of Matthew, I did not come to bring peace to the world, but I came to bring the sword. In Matthew 10, verse 34 to 39, it says, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. When Jesus came the first time, He came to prepare the way, but only when He comes the second time will He bring peace on this earth. Only when Jesus comes as the, as the King of kings and the Lord of lords will there be eternal peace. Peace is a transitory thing. But he says here, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I came to turn a man against his brother, and a daughter against his mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A person's enemies will include members of his own family. And the one who loves his father or mother more than me isn't worthy of me. And the one who loves a son or daughter more than me isn't worthy of me and the one who doesn't take up his cross and follow me isn't worthy of me and the one who finds his life will lose it and the one that loses his life because of me will find it God's way is not man's way it's the other way round and what will we be proud of when we stand before God. And in 1 Corinthians 3 verses 7 to 23. He says. So neither the one who plants. Nor the one who waters is significant. But God who keeps everything growing. Is the one who matters. The one who plants and the one who waters have the same goal. And each will receive a reward for his own action. For we are God's co-workers. And you are God's farmland and God's building. As an expert builder, using the grace that God gave me, I have laid the foundation and someone else is building on it. But each person must be careful how he builds on it. After all, no one can lay another foundation than the one that is already laid. A house only has one foundation. And someone else is building on it. Okay, it's already laid. And that is Jesus the Messiah, the foundation. So whether a person builds on the foundation with gold, silver, expensive stones, wood, hay and straw, the workmanship of each person will become evident. For the day of judgment will show what it is, because it will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's action. Our God is a consuming fire. And if what a person has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. And if his work is burnt up, he will suffer loss. However, he himself will be spared. But it will be like going through the fire. This is the mercy of Jesus. We will, we will be spared at the Bema Seat. But whatever works, whatever deed, whatever actions, you see the wood, the hay and the stubble is all the stuff that's above the ground. The gold and the silver and the jewels are all underneath the ground. That is the stuff that is hidden. Those are the treasures. The stuff that's above the ground and that's flashing 
will be consumed by his fire because that's not what God is interested in he's interested in and the thing is you don't trust children with jewels do you you don't give your gold and your silver and your diamonds to a baby do you they're not going to treasure it they're not going to respect it they're not going to use it the way that God intended but we have this to thank the price is paid in full everything every single deed thought action sin unrighteousness has been paid in full by Jesus Christ when he said it is finished it is done on the cross it's we are a purchased possession of God and so if he is now paid in full we are God's sanctuary and his possession and this is continuing from that 1 Corinthians 3 and says you know that you are God's sanctuary and that God's spirit lives in you don't you if anyone destroys God's sanctuary God will destroy him for God's sanctuary is holy and you are that sanctuary and let no one deceive himself if any of you thinks he is wise in the ways of this world he must become a fool to really become wise for the wisdom of this world is nonsense in God's sight for it is written he catches the wise with their own trickery and again the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are worthless so let no one boast about human beings since everything belongs to you whether Paul Apollos Cephas the world life death the present or the future everything belongs to you is what Paul writes he says but you belong to the Messiah and the Messiah belongs to God He's paid the price in full for us and our spiritual man belongs to him. So what matters most is how well you walk through the fire. You know in Isaiah there's that scripture it says we will walk through the fire and we will not get burned. And the water will come and it will not overflow us. We will not drown. And when we walk through the fire we know that Jesus is holding our hand it's like in the book of Daniel in the fire where Jesus protected Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego I get the names wrong but anyway when we walk through his fire see unless I've walked through the fire myself I cannot help anyone else through that fire to be a hand to pull someone else out of that fire People don't want sympathy. They don't want you to feel sorry for them. But God gives us experiences in our lives. And He takes us into the darkness. And then reveals His light and brings us out of the darkness. So that that darkness we understand. So when we see somebody else in that dark place, we are able to lift them out. And this is the testimony that Jesus gives us. And it's the empathy. It's the understanding of what that is like. So each of us have a witness for somebody. For everybody. And whatever experience has happened in your life, God creates a testimony out of that. He takes the biggest mess and creates the biggest message. So we don't look down on somebody unless I am willing to pick them up and God ends this cycle Jesus ended the curse of the law and the wages of sin we discussed this last week and Jesus is the cure to the curse is the cure to all sickness to all sin and all hurt and the law of God came so the knowledge of sin might be revealed but Jesus nailed the curse of the law 
to a tree so that I might live. So God, wake me up inside. Wake me up, God. Revive me. What would I want? Would I want God to use fear, control, and power to motivate and make me do what He wants? Or do I want God to pour out His love and grace in me, to set me free, to prove me, to try me, to test me, to save me, to save others? Jesus gave all of Him for all of me. I am no longer mine, and I belong to Him. We pray for revival. But are we really ready in our hearts for a true revival? Revival is not signs and wonders, but the total change in the moral character in a community forever. It's not just a meeting. This is an encounter with the living, the Holy Spirit of the living God that brings lasting repentance and complete death to ourselves. It's not a phase. It's not a movement. Revival is complete change and transformation. And one of the studies I will do is between true revival of God and false revival of God. Because a true revival changes the character of the community. Those t televisions go out the window. You no longer belong to yourself. You have no interest in the things of this world. They become strangely dim. And the true cost of revival is everything. Are we ready for that? So if God cannot move and change me, then nothing else will. Thank you.